So that's the power of storytelling is not to tell a story. It's to take the listener on a journey, on a ride. It's like a roller coaster. Everything I do centers around storytelling. I mean, because I, I work in theater, television, film, novels, all, you know, all, every, everything that's all storytelling. And if you think about storytelling for just a moment and don't think immediately, oh, I'm not a writer, I'm not a storyteller. Well, you are. Everybody is because everybody tells stories. You do it all day long. Number one is your partner in storytelling. You have a partner. You don't think you do. You think you're all alone. Your partner is the other person's imagination. Anytime you're pitching or telling a story, you want to activate the listener's imagination. You don't want them sitting back and just absorbing whatever you do, whatever you say. You want them to be a participant. And so you have to get them to participate in the story, even though they don't know where the story is going. But when you present your story as if it's happening right now, and that you, the storyteller, very important, do not know how it's going to turn out. That's when you've got your audience trapped. And I can say, and then, then they walked around the corner and you'll never guess who I saw. I mean, there he was right in front of me. I mean, you, I mean, it's, and now you're going, who? Oh, that's manipulation. I'm going to keep you hanging for a while and you, I got to keep you engaged in the journey we're on. But the, you know, the risks in filmmaking are huge because a lot of times in order, just in order to get the money, to, in order to get, well, you're asking a lot of people to put up money for something that doesn't exist. I wrote and made a short film called The Baritones, which is based on The Sopranos. But The Baritones is about <coughs> the film, bi film business and how it's no different than the mafia. And we, 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 we even use the same terms, you know, kill that project. You won't mention that. <laughs> See that's see that's manipulation right there, Paul. Okay, I'm not going to mention sociopath, and I'm not going. Okay, we're talking about your mother. I'm not going to talk. I don't want to mention people who are just loyal to their children because that wouldn't be fair to her. So, suddenly, there it is. It's out. It's out. So he's he's got a team of people, and he says, "Okay, okay, let's get let's do, let's do this." And he walks from behind his desk, comes over, and sits in that throne. Like a king, and I went, oh my! God. And you, I could feel it in the room. The whole room goes, oh, really? And suddenly, like within a day, Paul, the budget went from three million to nine million. Oh, really? And I remember looking at, I go, what changed? Nothing changed. You know what changed? Yeah. Because it was a studio picture. Yeah. Every vendor, everybody you're working with is charging more. Getting back to instinct, intuition, basically, that's all you've got. The base, the main thing is just make sure do not abandon your vision or your instincts. Just before we get started, if you're enjoying the podcast, can you please hit subscribe or follow? This helps me tremendously to grow my channel. Welcome, Mark, to the podcast. It's great to have you on. Well, it's terrific to be here, Paul. I look forward to it, to wherever we're going to go, whatever we're going to do. Yes, it's the, it's the unknown. We can go anywhere, and that's that's what's more interesting and exciting, I find. That's um, right. Just like uh, with your um, development of characters as well, you just don't know. It's like in real life, you don't know where it's going to go. That's a good you know, character development, but we can get into all of that a bit later. So, Mark, yep. you're known as the director's director. And you've mm -hmm. worked in the film industry, you've worked in um, Broadway and done lots of different uh, productions and like you have a, a massive career. So can you just give us a bit of an overview about you know, where you started in that career and a bit of an overview of, of your career and, and what you've done? <clears throat> yeah, to try to keep it brief. Um... I started out studying theater when I was in college, and that was a big epiphany for me to find something that I really was passionate about. Mm -hmm. And after college, I went to graduate school at Yale in theater, still directing. And following Yale, I moved to California for a lot of reasons, and eventually slowly found myself, besides directing theater, getting into the world of television. 
And I got into the world of television first as an intern, like a PA, and then learning from inside, working with a lot of different production companies, and eventually directing some television, and then eventually directing film. Now, that's a very short version. The um, important thing about that is my focus was always on directing. It was always, even though I worked as an actor many times, I would write scripts. Um, that would get made, but I, my focus was directing. And after which we can talk about, I directed my first film for a major studio, Warner Brothers, and it did not do well. And because it did not do well, it, my trajectory, my career was in jeopardy. I could feel it. Mm. And <clears throat> what I needed to do at that time to support myself and my family was uh, I needed to keep working. Mm -hmm. And working work was coming becoming hard, so I went, I went back to something I had done a little bit earlier, which was teaching. I okay. started teaching, started teaching acting, and then started teaching directing, and then I realized one of these strange things. I realized after a while, I created a whole new business. I created a whole new career that was doing very well. My directing career was not going well, but mainly because I was focused on teaching. And I discovered over the years, I think this is true, I'm a much better coach, teacher, mm -hmm. consultant than I am a director. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, as a director, I can make mistakes, which I should see. But anyway, so that started a whole teaching career that's been going on now for what, 40, 50 years. Mm -hmm. um, this, this teaching, and that's where the director's director com comes in because I work mostly with directors now. I work with some writers and some actors now and there, but mostly with directors or creators. And so I've been known as someone, and somehow the label came up, the director's director. Okay. It, it's interesting because um, you, you say that, you know, your, your directing career didn't go as you planned, but there are all these, you know, really top directors that are consulting with you and bringing you on the set yep. and you're working with them. So you must be doing something right. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah, it's um, – which gets, you know, gets into a really interesting part of my career. I can very often, where it, wherever it comes from, um, I think I have an idea where it comes from. I can see the problems long before um, – the writer, director, or producer can see them. I see them. I sense them. I can read a script one time and see challenges, problems, things that are going to come up later and be, become bigger, maybe become bigger problems. And this instinct that I have, um, or gift or whatever, and sometimes I even, quite seriously, Paul, think it's channeling because I don't know where it comes from. I just, mm -hmm. I don't, it's not this ability to see. Um, a lot of aspects of a script or a story or even a performance uh, before other people can can is not something I work on. I don't work at it. I don't try to. It's something that it happens. It's an instinct. And I think it's um, recently, no, more than recently, um, it's become clear to me that if this is because of my dyslexia. Now, dyslexia... Um, no matter how much you know about it, dyslexia, <clears throat> to me, for me, is a gift because mm -hmm. I can look at, um, I can, I can look at a scene that's on stage, actors acting on stage, and I can see multiple camera angles simultaneously mm -hmm. in my head. Wow. I can see it from very different perspectives. I can read a script and see it from different perspectives simultaneously. So I can say, here's a possibility or whole. Why isn't it this? Or especially, looking at the subtext, trying to sense the subtext. I can sense it very quickly, what a variety of things it could be or, or not. So that to me, this dyslexia that I have is a gift. It's a gift which I bring to everything. So people say, how do you see that? I say, I don't know, but I do. But let's keep keep working. I can't. Mm -hmm. Can you teach me how to be a little dyslexic? <laughs> I, can't, I, can't, can't, I can't do that. I can't do that. So, so there are some aspects of what I do that I really can't teach. I can share with, and I share a lot. So, um, and many times, like with writers who have worked for years on a script, I can read a script sometimes and then tell them what I think it's really all about. And they go, 
How did you know that? How did you figure, you know, yeah. again, I don't know. It just comes to me. It comes to me. So this is a gift, which I think in the work I'm doing, it's a better way to use this gift than just directing. Yeah. I mean, in other words, the gift I'm bringing to other people is expansion, expansion of ways of looking at it, not limitations. When you're directing, you have to keep narrowing it down and make choices. I keep opening that up and saying there are other choices. So, and that's why a lot of directors like working with me because it, it's uh, two two directors working together, but seeing it very, very differently. Yeah, it's really interesting. And I do believe in like intuition channeling, whatever you want to call it. I definitely, mm -hmm. think, um, we all have that. And some yep. are more perceptive um, to that than others and in certain things as well and can be things that we're more passionate about as well. Um, mm -hmm. Because like if, if you, you know, talk to musicians or um, somebody that writes poetry or writers, a lot of the stuff just comes to them and they're just writing in that moment. Like I do a bit mm -hmm. of poetry and it's, if I try and think about, oh, I'm going to write, no. Nah. But sometimes just this inspiration, it all just comes and I can do this poem in, you know, like a couple of minutes. And or, or yeah. I've, I've written some songs as well and it just, just comes to me. Um, yeah. And it's definitely what I, I call intuition, other people call instinct or whatever it may be. It is like mm -hmm. general, I think. So it's really interesting. So, yeah, so um, that first big movie, um, because this channel we talk about, you know, problems that we've had, how we overcome them or failures, but failures as in something we learn from. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? So, you know, the build up to that and what you're expecting and how you felt and then you know, when, when it didn't go as well as you thought. Like, tell us that story. Well, that, yeah, the, the first big movie, that's what you're yeah. talking about. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I have to go back a little bit and lead into it. Um, in my directing career, um, I had a big shift or change or an addition to my career back in the late 1980s when a friend of mine lost his wife to cancer. And he's an actor. He and I had worked together a lot. And he wanted to create a, th a theater piece about her death because she died at home. He says it was the most miraculous thing. All that you get the idea <clears throat> yeah. and i said to him i said okay we'll do that after her memorial service we there was her memorial service which was beautiful and he spoke at the service and when i heard him speak about her after her death it became clear to me that we're not going to create a play we, he has to do he has to do it all by himself a one-man show i presented him that idea he went ah i don't know if i can do that i said i think you can and I introduced him to the work of Spalding Gray and other monologists. And we did we did a show. It took us about a year to develop it. So this was a year of serious development. The two of us working on this show, it opened. It ran for years. It ran sold out in Los Angeles for years. Eventually became, and he traveled all over the world doing it. And it eventually became an HBO special. Wow. The, the key of that story is developing autobiographical one-person shows. Meanwhile, I started to do others. People would come to me. Can you work with me? Can you work with me? Yeah. And eventually, I worked with a person named Chaz Palman Terry, and we, I, I created, I encouraged him to do a one-person show. He wasn't, was not really interested at first, but we did it. it. took about 10 months, and we created A Bronx Tale, which went on to run forever in Los Angeles, ran off-Broadway, eventually ran on Broadway, became a Broadway musical, and went on and became a film directed by Robert De Niro. So the, these are um, projects I was working on that just became huge. Now, I was basically in the development directing zone. That's what I was doing, and a little bit of writing. While A Bronx Tale was running in Los Angeles, and it was a big hit, we were, Chaz and I, were getting offers. Uh, the biggest one we turned down was I think one point something million I wanted to buy the, the property, buy the script. These are from major studios. Okay. And we kept saying no. And we kept saying no because we felt it was more valuable and that it would get more valuable the longer it ran, which was true because then, then it went on to New York. All that was true. But what, during that period that we kept turning people down, it was a very sweet spot for me because I could call almost any studio and ask for a meeting with somebody. 
Mm-hmm. And as soon as they realized, oh, this is Mark Travis, a Bronx tale, bring him in. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so I had, I had, you know, and I think in a lot of businesses, you, you, you don't know about these little sweet spots until they're gone. Because mm-hmm. <laughs> I thought, well, this is the way it works. So yeah. because of that, um, and meanwhile, I was working on another script that I was not writing that two people had come, two producers had come to me with to direct. And so I would set up meetings at like Warner Brothers and Universal, places like that, to pitch that project, not pitch A Bronx Tale. Of course, I'd go in and the first thing we would talk about is A Bronx Tale. I'd say, okay, yeah, but that's not why I'm here. I'm here because of this other project. And so consequently, that second project uh, was called Going Under, um, was set up at Warner Brothers. Now it was set up, and I was now on the business side of this, not the artistic side. Business side is very interesting. We, myself, and the two producers who are also the writers, wanted to make a very low budget independent film. That's what we wanted. We didn't want a big studio film. Warner Brothers picked up, says, "Yep, we'll give you the money. You make a low budget thing, and you know, but we have distribution rights and blah blah blah." And they were going to give us. It was going to be about a three million dollar, which was the right about the right size, three million dollar movie. <clears throat> But as we kept working on it, and they became more intrigued with it, Warner Brothers finally decided, no, we're going to produce it. We will produce it. You don't produce it on your own. We'll produce it for you. And suddenly, like within a day, Paul, the -hmm. budget went from $3 million to $9 million. And I remember looking at, I go, what changed? Nothing changed. You know what changed? Because it was a studio picture. Yeah. Every vendor, everybody you're working with is charging more. Oh, oh if Warner Brothers is producing, well, if Warner Brothers, you go to the caterer, the people who are just bringing in the food. Or if it's yeah. a Warner Brothers picture, then this is our fee. <clears throat> Everything oh. went up. Everything went. And so suddenly I'm, I'm directing a $9 million picture, wow. uh, which I thought should be a $3 million picture. But because um, – of the larger budget and because of Warner Brothers, more producers were put on it. So now I've, I've got a whole bevy of producers and some wow. of them who are loyalists to Warner Brothers, not to me wow. and not even to the movie that much. But, you know, you watch the budget, you make sure of this. And one of those sadly turned out to be um, a bit of a criminal uh, stealing money and all of that stuff. But not not my fault, but it impacts mm-hmm. uh, the work we were doing enormously. And when that film was finished, uh, it was coming near the finish. And the big wake up call for me was as a director is realizing I have so little control over this picture. So little. It's all been shot. Everybody loves what we've done. We shot it. I'm editing it. And now all of a sudden, big, big guns are coming in, big powerful yeah. people. No, no, we're, we're going to cut it this way. We have to cut it this way. Yeah. And suddenly all my artistic sensibilities and, and the, um, what I thought I was making was being slowly taken away from me because they wanted this picture to fit into a different notch. Let's put it that way. Then yeah. I saw it. Yeah. You know, I saw it as an adult comedy. They saw it as a teenage com- comedy. Yeah. And it's not a teenage comedy at all. So, in fact, one producer uh, came to see a screening we did, a preview screening we did for an audience, which did not go well. And this is another learning thing that I went through. That audience, I was shocked when I saw the audience. They were all young kids. Some of them is five years old, some eight, a lot of teenagers, and, and so some with their parents. And I'm going, well, this isn't our audience. This is not the audience. So the preview went on. It did not do well. And I told the studio executive, very high level. Um, I have long stories about him, but very high level. He came, he was there, and he was, you know, saying to all of us, it's a disaster, disaster. And I said, said to him, look, I can't, I can't use his name, but I said, look, Mr. So-and-so, <clears throat> that is not the audience this movie is being made for. We have another preview next week for, for get an older audience, get, you know, people at least in their 20s, 30s and 40s, because a lot of the jokes and the humor, they'll understand these. And he said to me, no, this movie is being made for that audience, the one we just said, and we'll make it work for them. And that was the death of the movie, because oh. now they're trying to re-edit it. And the, and the power structure of executives and people like that who really are not filmmakers, they're businessmen. 
They're very yeah. good businessmen, but they're not art artists. Mm -hmm. Forcing everybody who's working on it, the whole editorial staff and everything, to twist the movie to for a specific audience, and con and they did, I guess, the best they could, but it failed. Yeah. And then they said, "That's it. It's over." So that was that was the demise of that movie, and that's why after that, I realized, "Oh, this is not good. Yeah. Not good. Make your first movie for a big studio, and the studio takes over and tries to save it and can't." Mm. or doesn't looks like it doesn't and yeah. i remember going for my next jobs that i had interviews for and they said okay so what what was the movie you did yeah what was the here was the question how did it do on its first weekend that's <laughs> all they wanted to they did not want to know anything about the movie so what kind of movie it was how did it do you know if i if i said to me you know first weekend 20 million dollars okay well it didn't do that yeah. you know so it, that their test, litmus test of a successful movie is how well it does on its first weekend. It, it just so these, these are all learning things that you don't know about. Yeah, yeah. It just all of that just kills the uh, yeah the artistry and the creativeness, the, the whole process. Mm -hmm. Having business people take over a creative process is no, it's just just not on. And it's it's interesting that the. The movie was called Going Under. <laughs> yes, I used to say it's called Going Under, and that's exactly what it did. You know, it's about it's about a sub. It's a comedy that takes place on a submarine. But anyway, so that that was a big um, learning lesson. And the the other thing is how if your first film doesn't do well, or the last film you does doesn't do well, boy, it just hangs over you forever. Mm. It's it's really you know that's that that's the way that's the business side that's the way the industry works. Mm. It, it's it's interesting. And let's say if you could summarize what you can take out of that and say, um, let's say you're talking to an early stage startup founder, um, mm -hmm. where let's say you know a lot of them they get funding and then the people that fund them try and control a lot of stuff as well, and the same sort of thing happens. If you could summarize, yeah. you know, what sort of advice you could give um, so that others don't fall into that trap? Well, there are, there are a couple of things. One is, I mean, if you have something like another company or a funder or some, some financial organization fin financing your efforts, mm -hmm. be really clear about it. They own it. Mm. They, on a financial side, it's theirs. If they put up, you know, five million, nine million, ten million, whatever, whatever they put up that you need to to take this effort, basically they own it. And so your job is really keep them happy, mm. keep them happy, even if it means you have to go against your own instincts. Some and if you can think ahead, you can say, okay, if this fails, will it look like it's my fault or their fault? Mm. If it looks like it's a bad decision on their part. Then you yeah. forgive them. Okay, this it was a good. I think you were right. It was a good idea, but it didn't work. In other words, if you can keep the the blame shifted away from you, mm. that's number one. But the the other thing is because I was working with a whole uh, bevy of producers and other studio executives and personnel. I think that one of the most important things, and I I really don't know how to teach anybody, anybody to do this. Understand that everybody has a hidden agenda. Every individual does. Mm -hmm. You know, <clears throat> of course they want to do a good job. Of course they want to keep their job. Of course they want, you know, this this project to be successful. They want <clears throat> all of that. Everything that they say they want, they want. But underneath is a hidden agenda. And, and what is it a promotion? Is it are they are they seeking a better relationship with someone who's above them? What are they are they trying to align themselves with another company that's maybe a competitive company? I mean, what what are they doing that they're not um, really revealing to anybody else because that is what's driving them. And two of the producers that I worked with, the two that wrote this film, I did not know were bargaining with Warner Brothers for a separate production deal and with the idea and along with that, that they would take over this film, the final edit of this film to prove what they could do. Right. Now, did they tell me? No. So all of this is going on around me, behind me, or the other producer who actually um, was was um, hired by 
Warner Brothers. It was a Warner Brothers loyalist. He, he worked at Warner Brothers for years as a producer. Yeah. And he was always after me to keep cutting the budget. We got to cut the budget. We got to cut. Can you put these two scenes in, in the same set? Can we get a little with the set? Now I'm doing it for the first time. So I'm doing the best. Thing. And I did some um, compromises that did hurt the film a bit. I did some things that were very creative and didn't hurt the film in order to save money. So I brought the film in. Um, we went over time, but under budget. We kept it under budget. Little did I know that what he was doing, and I'll tell you where the money came from, he pulled close to $100,000 out of that budget in order to put a down payment on a ranch that he was buying. Right. <laughs> and and there's, there's another little thing. This is, this is very unique to the world of filmmaking. Mm -hmm. If I'm working at a certain fee, and I'm working at a set fee that's set up, that's determined very early, and then we look at the number of shooting days we have, right? Mm -hmm. We have fifty. We have fifty shooting days, which is a lot. Fifty shooting days, and then so my rate is calculated that the fee I get divided by fifty. So they say this is how much he gets per day. Ironically, if we go over schedule which we did by five days, go over schedule, I get paid more <laughs> per, for those five days because that's my rate. That just automatically happens. That has to do with unions and everything else. I didn't yeah. even know that. He right. knew that. So that overage that I was getting ended up in his pocket. Really? But it, and it was discovered during post-production while we're trying to finish the film. So also legal matters are going on. Lawyers are involved. It's messy. Now, that's not something I could have predicted or, but it's just a story to realize that, you know, everybody is out for themselves, mm -hmm. everybody. Um, and what you're really looking for with in terms of collaborators who, whose top priority is not you. Mm -hmm. Top priority is the film, the story that it does well, that that's their top priority. They'll serve you, but they're not thinking about themselves or their paycheck or their career or their next job. Yeah. And those, those are hard to find, but you can find them. Yeah. I think like the lesson for founders could be, you know, if you're going to get um, collaborators or particularly people funding uh, investors or VC, mm -hmm. check them out really well and just don't go with the first one that offers you a whole lot of money. Right. If, they, if you haven't checked them out well and they're not really the right thing for you. Because mm -hmm. you know, and all of a sudden, someone and this happened with us. Someone offered us um, half half a million dollars for twenty percent, and then they were in the industry we're in and had all the connections, and we thought that's that's fantastic. Um, but it didn't really work out, and it, it wasn't the person really that would have been so good for us. And in the end, we put in all this effort, and he pulled out right at the last minute, so that really messed us up emotionally as well. So I guess. Mm -hmm. don't, someone offers you a lot of money check them out first and make sure it's really right for what you're doing because otherwise and there's another lesson here as well that i learned from another person a vc that i interviewed nick mcnaughton when i did his course if you get investors on then usually they'll want to be on the board okay so let's say you have two founders and then two investors come in so you've got four people on the board two investors and two founders and let's say i'm the ceo right I can be sacked. They can take a vote and I can be sacked and then I'm off the board and then the investors, they have all the power. So that's, that's right. something to, to watch that's out for right. as well. There's a lot of trust that's in right. there. That's right. That, that, that can happen. And the other thing, and this is, I don't, this is not unique to filmmaking and all that, but it's very important because we hire people for a short period of time. I mean, you hire a, a production designer for the period of time you're going to make the film. And then when, when you're done making the film, he's gone. So you're not looking for that, that long range thing. And one of the most important things I learned is you're going to, and this is true of actors and everybody else, talk to other people who have worked with them. Mm -hmm. And I, what I've found in, at least in my business, if I call a director who doesn't know me and I say, okay, I'm thinking of hiring this actor, working with this actor. Really? Yeah, yeah. Can we talk? I went to, you worked with them. Yep, I did. You did this film with them. Yep. And so all that information is available. Say, so can we talk? And then most directors are very willing to. They're willing to help out another director. Mm. 
And it might be, listen, he's going to seem like a pain in the ass at the beginning. He's going to seem awful. And then, but he's brilliant. He's a brilliant. In other words, you, you want someone's, not just someone else's perspective, someone else's experience of working with that person or that production designer or that cinematographer or that editor. Mm -hmm. And that's something else that I, I knew a little bit before. And I know a lot now. Mm -hmm. And just make you know, and sometimes it's a ten minute phone call, and you can learn a lot. Mm -hmm. So I would think the same thing would be um, in your situation. An investor comes along. Where else have they invested? Who else have they worked with? Who would be probably happy to tell you what their experience was, good or bad? They'll share it. Mm -hmm. It can be very valuable. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. It's funny because you say that because I notice in lots of movies and series. It seems like there's a hundred actors and they're all recycled in all of them. And and I sort of get why, because having worked with actors as well, just you know, briefly, yeah. um, having a good actor is just you know, it's such a good experience and having a, a bad actor or someone who's not really good is really mm -hmm. a horrible experience when you're directing mm -hmm. uh, for yep. the whole production. So I can see why like them that have a reputation to be really good actors. Um, they're probably really good on set and, and all of that. So I can see why people want to keep rehiring them as well. I mean, it's, yeah. not, it's not great for others. Like, you know, obviously new actors are coming up all the time. They need to get That's an opportunity. Right. So it's not good for that. But I, I can see why I constantly see um, same actors coming along. In fact, every yeah. time I was in the series now, I think, Oh, I know him from another series. I'm looking up on IMDb and, oh, yeah, that's right. It's like i got to know <laughs> what, where I've seen him before. So that's, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so Mark, um, you do various courses, and I've done uh, four of your courses, and one is um, it's called Right for Your Life. It's on um, auto, autobiographical storytelling, which is writing. Mm -hmm. um, and you also do a course on staging, which I absolutely love. And that's where you place actors um, according to the environment, other actors, etc. cetera. Um, mm -hmm. Different um, emotions uh, in the actors, in, in the audience, etc. cetera. And um, also what you call the interrogation process, which is really unique um, in the industry. And it's really fascinating. I've just tried it a few times and I really mm -hmm. saw the character come out uh, unbelievably. Mm -hmm. so, you know, you talk about how the act you don't want actors acting, you want actors becoming the character, and that's what your mm -hmm. interrogation process is right. about. It's a lot of fun and it's very fascinating as well. And then the other course I did was, um, uh, I think it's um, directing for children, or you know, um, oh. I'll forget the yeah. actual name, yeah. yeah. There's one work, yeah, working with child actors, yeah, yeah, yeah. and so. Um, and, and that can be applied to adults as well. So that's really yep. infusing the script with so much information uh, about that character that, you know, the, the, the child really understands that and they, they just play it out. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very useful for adults as well. But going back to storytelling, and I, I know that you're going to be doing a new course on storytelling as well, which is going to be broader than just directors and actors. Yeah. Uh, and so storytelling is really important in, in every part of life, really. Right. Um, particularly for startups. So there's a lot of pitching going on in startups and talking to people and, you know, the elevator pitch and the three minute pitch and the, the pitch you got to do to a bunch of investors or pitch night, all that sort of thing. And, um, I guess, yeah, I'd like to know more about your method of storytelling. Uh, and, and also, because what I understand is when, when you tell a story, and, and I did that course, and there's fascinating things. There's what you call the naive narrator, the omniscient narrator. There's this mm -hmm. different ways to get people in and out of the story. Um, mm -hmm. but what we're trying to do, what you're trying to do is make people feel um, as if they're going through that story, um, the feelings mm -hmm. and emotions of that character. And I thought, and, and for example, if I say to you, oh, look, um, you know, this car, I was driving along and this car skidded and swerved, nearly hit me. I was really fearful and, and, and really scared. It doesn't mean anything to you. Okay, you, I'm just saying I was this, I was that. But what you try and do is to get them to feel like they're there in that moment as well. And I thought for pitching, 
you usually you always start with the problem, and then later you know um, how you can resolve that. So how, I, I thought it'd be really interesting if we could actually get the audience to feel like they're in that problem, and going through that problem, I think it'd be much more powerful. And so oh, it would, it would, yeah. 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 So, for example, my startup was 360 virtual reality training. So what we do is place people in a real life scenario, like it's in hospitality. So, for example, in a bar, and they need mm -hmm. to service and they make different choices and um, they'll see the consequences straight away. So I would say, um, you know, this in the industry is lots of people that are young people who come in, they haven't got experience, they encounter these situations are really stressed out and then you know the industry has a high turnover rate etc cetera, etc cetera, and what we can do but i think it, it could be a lot more interesting than that that's just one example so mm -hmm. you just if you can just give us a brief overview of storytelling and maybe how that could apply to pitching as well for startups <laughs> a brief I, I love that a brief <laughs> overview of storytelling oh, okay oh, how much <laughs> How much Why time do you have? <laughs> the, well, the thing is, number one, just getting back to the basics here, Paul, which is what you're touching on. Thank you for bringing all, all of that that I do up. Um, everything I do centers around storytelling. I mean, because I, I work in theater, television, film, novels, all, you know, all, every, everything that's all storytelling. And if you think about storytelling for just a moment and don't think immediately, oh, I'm not a writer, I'm not a storyteller. Well, you are. Everybody is because everybody tells stories. You do it all day long. Yeah. You know, honey, how was your day? Well, let me tell you what happened. You know, we're going to get a story. You ask for stories, you give stories. We connect through our stories. So everybody, forget film and television and going to the movies and all that. I mean, that's a big part of it, obviously. But we're all used to living in a world of stories, and we – all are intrigued by stories. So for anybody in business, especially, um, who can sort of wrestle with how to tell a story, the question is how, do, the question isn't so much which story to tell, how do I tell this story? Or get back to your example, when you say pitching, you know, you say start out with the problem. How do I get the listener into the problem? Now, I could say, you know, in our business, that we have a big problem and here's what it is. And he'll go, yeah, 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 I know that. Well, that's not very interesting. <laughs> not very interesting because there's no story there. There's just yeah. information. Yeah. But if you're saying to somebody that you want to pitch to, say, Paul, let me tell you something. You know, three days ago, I'm sitting in, I'm sitting in this boardroom and I'm listening to people. Now I'm telling a story. Listen to this guy talk and I'm pontificating. And I'm thinking about what I'm doing. And suddenly, suddenly I had, because of what somebody else says, I had this epiphany. I had this. I have a problem that I didn't know I had. Now the listener is going to go, "Great, tell me what it is." Yeah. Now, now I'm taking you on a journey. I realized that I was assuming that this was the, and then because of that, I was assuming. But if I didn't assume, if I approach it, I think. So what I did, I went home. Now I'm at home and I'm working on. You know, now I'm on a story. I've gotten to the problem already, and the, the listener's probably going, "Well, that's interesting. Yeah. Now what? Now what did?" Now, what did you do? What did you do next? That's mm -hmm. the story. Mm -hmm. So if you can, and this is what you're talking about, Paul, can you bring the listener into the, the journey you've already had, which is the story you're going to tell. But if you could bring the listener into that story, so the listener is experiencing it moment to moment to moment, just like you are, maybe making the same false assumptions that you are. Mm -hmm. until you say yeah but then when this other guy joe said this i went wait a minute he's right i don't have to worry about that and maybe your listener goes really why not <laughs> so so your listener is riding right beside you yeah riding with you and mm -hmm. cannot get ahead of you because you're not giving him any information in front of where to go he may assume he knows where it's going that's fine that's not a problem but you want him riding with you so, so it's a matter of how to bring um, the listener into the middle of the story. And I'll give you a quick example. Any film you see, yeah. any film you see is um, presented on the screen in the present tense as if it's happening right now. Mm -hmm. 
It's right. not. It's not saying, you know, once upon a time, there was a big city named Troy and they were at war with, you know, it's, that's all past tense. You go, oh, God, please, not that. But that brings you right into it. We cut to Troy. We see the people. We see them struggling. In other words, it's presented as if it's happening now. A play is presented as if it's happening now. Many novels are presented that way. Some are not. But when you present your story as if it's happening right now and that you, the storyteller, very important. Do not know how it's going to turn out. That's when you've got your audience trapped. Mm -hmm. If you put it in the past tense, you obviously know how it's going to turn out. If you put yeah. it in the present tense, it feels like you don't. And that's a trick. It's a trick to keep the audience engaged because now they're, they're guessing along with you. What are you going to do? How are you going to do this? So I get this great idea. And I go into great idea. So I got rid of, I took all these journals that I went to. And you're listening to me going, I don't know if that's such a great idea. And you go, no, it's a great idea. May, they may be disagreeing with you, but they have to ride with you to find out what does happen. Yeah. So that's yeah. the power of storytelling yeah. is not to tell a story. It's to take the listener on a journey, on a ride. It's like a roller coaster. Ride. I'm going to take you on a ride. Just hang on. You'll be okay. Hang on. We'll get to the end. And then you take them on a ride. And then they're engaged. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, yeah, most, well, yeah, just about everything, um, movies and, and series, etc. Like, and, and I guess the ones that are, you really get engaged with, and I think they're called breaking the fourth wall, where you forget mm -hmm. about even who you are, they're the ones that are doing that really well, I imagine. Yep. The others, yeah. You're looking at your phones <laughs> on Twitter or whatever. So, yep, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. That's a good way to tell that. Yeah. Or that's yeah. So you're taking them on a ride, and it's a sort of uh, you're not in a bad way, but it's it's a sort of a, manip a manipulation as well, isn't it? It is. Yeah, yeah. it's it's inter inter interesting word because mm -hmm. which I've used a lot. It mm -hmm. is manipulation. It is mm -hmm. audience manipulation. Right. Mm -hmm. And I've had many people say, oh, I don't like manipulation. I don't like it. I said, well, do you think you could get through your life without doing it? <laughs> How did you get your last job? How did you convince your bo boss to do it? How did you, you know, you realize, oh, like, I'm manipulating people all day long. Yes, you are. And they're manipulating you. And, that, and it's okay. Oh, manipulation is not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Manipulation to me sometimes is getting the, the listener to stop thinking about other things so they can concentrate on what I'm talking about. Stop thinking about all the resistance. So, oh, where's the story going? I got to stop that because that's, that's a, an obstacle to my taking them on the ride. If I can stop them from thinking about other things by getting them so engaged through manipulation into what's happening. Yeah. Right. And I could say, and then, then I walked around the corner and you'll never guess who I saw. I mean, there he was right in front of me. I mean, you I mean, it's, now you're going, oh, that's manipulation. I'm going to keep you hanging for a while. And you, I got to keep you engaged in the journey we're on. Yeah. Now, good, good filmmakers, good storytellers, good novelists know how to do that. That's when yeah. you get those page turners. You can't put the book down because you have been manipulated. You've been sucked into that world. And that's your job as a storyteller. So everybody does it. Yeah. The people who don't like manipulation is they don't like being manipulated. <laughs> so I say, okay, that's fine, but it is, it is, it is manipulation. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting, and, and also I was remembering a, a story um, talking about pitching. Um, I don't know if it's for the same movie Going Under, but you were pitching, I think, to Warner Brothers, one of the top executives, and you tell tell that story how you prepared, etc. Would you mind mm -hmm. telling that story again, and then yeah, what actually happened? Because uh, I, I thought that it's just a story I always remember. Okay. Well, yeah, I can, I'd be happy to tell that story. But since I've already told another little story about Warner Brothers, I'm going to give you a little piece of information. The studio executive who said to me at the preview screening, mm -hmm. no, this, you know, it's not made for the adults. This is made for children and we'll make it, we will make it work for them. Same yeah. guy. Same guy. I'm going to, oh, as, okay. OK, um, so early on in the process where we um, we 
the one thing we don't have, and you hear about this a lot, is a green light. The green light is a total, go ahead and make the movie. Nothing, nothing, nothing's in the way right now. Mm-hmm. Now, <clears throat> I had been hired. We had hired a lot of people. We had hired designers and uh, a lot of actors were on hold on uh, under some, some, some kind of contractual situation. So we, and we had spent, I think to that, up to that point, mm, half a million to three quarters of a million dollars. Mm-hmm. Now, a lot of it's office space, but we've been working for weeks and we all know that there's a, a important meeting that's coming up at Warner Brothers where we have to present to one of the top three executives and the um, there's the president under him as three executives, one of the top three, the project, and that person has the power to give us a green light. Okay. And that person usually is someone who has been involved with the project all along, you know, knows a lot about it, has been in touch with, they've been maybe not talking to me or anybody else, but they're in touch. So we, what we put together was a great presentation, great presentation. <clears throat> the presentation was going to start with the writer talking about the script, and then it was going to go into the production designers of what it, what it was going to look like, and they're going through all these key people. And the final person to talk would be me in terms of how I'm going to direct it. And there's like five of us that are going to talk, and we know we have very little time, so we all have very short little things that we rehearsed it, we rehearsed it. And the designers have graphics that they're going to show, pictures of, of the sets and blah, 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 all that. So you can imagine. And this is, so there's about six of us that are going into this meeting. And so we go, we arrive at the meeting with all our little stuff, our little dog and pony show and everything we're going to show. And we're set. We walk in to his office, this executive's office. It's a big office. I mean, these people, these guys have enormous offices. And he happens to be a very short person. I think he's like 5'2 or something like that, 5'3. But he's very powerful, very powerful man. And as soon as we walked into the office, I see over to the right a big table where we are sort of ushered over there to put all our stuff. But over to the other, other direction, I see a chair that's sitting up on a platform. There's a platform that's only about this high. And there's a chair on it, like an armchair. It looks a little bit like a throne. <laughs> I go, what? That's weird. I say, okay. And he comes out from behind his desk, and he has with him uh, about four executives that work under him. One of them is the one that's working with us, and uh, he's got four executives and other and his flunkies. So he's he's got a team of people. And he says, "Okay, okay, let's get let's do let's do this." And he walks from behind his desk, comes over, and sits in that throne <laughs> like a king. And I went, "Oh my!" And you, I could feel it in the room. The whole room goes, oh, "Really?" And uh-huh. the other, so he's sitting there, and behind yeah. him are standing these other people. It's, it's really like a, it's all staged, like out of some out of, out of Camelot or something. I don't know. It's crazy. Yeah. But that's okay. At least we know where there he is, and we and we have our stuff, and we are ready. And then he says, "Okay, I have fifteen minutes." <laughs> now, fifteen like, minutes. Yeah, yeah. Huh? Fifteen minutes is not going to do it. We need at least half an hour, maybe a little longer, <clears throat> to to just to do our part, and then talk about it afterwards. Yeah. Fifteen minutes. And I look back at our the producers who are on our side, and. It became very clear very quickly we couldn't make it. It wasn't going to work. And one by one, they sort of, in a way, non-verbally dropped us. said, no, okay, I won't do mine. I won't do mine. It was left up to me. They said, uh-huh. Mark, you do it. And I go, well, I was supposed to be last. Yeah. And I was just going to talk about the look of the film, the feel of the film, compare mm-hmm. it to other films, all that kind of stuff, which um, would make sense at the end of, of the whole presentation. So I went up there and I remember this vividly. I went up there and I started to talk to him and there he is. He's up on the throne, right? And I'm standing there because he's little, he's on a throne, but he's sitting down. So I'm still higher than him. Yeah. I'm looking down at him and I'm, t- and the first thing I did is, it is, and I went, my intention at that moment in a flash was I'm going to go through all the six steps we had very quickly. The script, the, 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 this, right? So I start talking about the script quickly. And 
I watched him and I realized, Paul, within a few minutes, he had not read the script because nothing I was saying with him was registering. You could see him going, huh? And when I mentioned this character, you know, and can Captain Banyan is going to do this, and then this guy that is going to do this. And then when the journal, I realized, oh my God, he doesn't know the story at all. And so I'm saying, we're, we're sunk. So I did two rather strange things. One is I started to tell a story, the story of the film. And I got down on my knees in front of him. I said, okay, here it is. Like talking, so, right? So now I'm lower than him, which will make him feel better. And yeah. okay, once upon a time, there was this captain, Captain Ben, and, and he's afraid of water, but he's running up. Uh, some, and I'm, I'm going through piece by piece as fast as I can, as clear as I can, of what the whole story is about. And then, then, then this, and the set's going to look this way. And I'm, and I'm just rattling along as fast as I can to get everything in in 15 minutes and Somehow, f within 15 minutes, I had touched on everything and even touched on the directing thing, and mm -hmm. I was done. Uh -huh. And then I just looked at him, and he went, okay. And then we left. That was it. That was the whole discussion. And we got the green light. We were uh -huh. shocked. <laughs> but, but, the bigger, the, but the bigger shock, not so much the shock of getting the green light, because we knew we had a good project, and it, and it and the budget was good. Everything was fine. But the fact that this man who had so much power was giving us 15 minutes to sell a whole concept, which he was going to throw $9 million at. And that's, you know, and he hadn't read it. And I, and jumping to the other story that I told at that previous screening, when he's, when he's at, and I'm still thinking, he still hasn't read it. He still mm -hmm. doesn't know. I mean, he's, mm -hmm. he's coming in with power, mm -hmm. but without knowledge or without any connection. So when he says, we'll make it work for them, I'm thinking, you don't know the script at all. You don't know what we do. And you certainly haven't looked, except the one screening, which he saw, at what we're doing to understand how I'm, you know, what, what I'm trying to make here. Mm -hmm. So that, that was, so he, he became a key, um, um, antagonist in my story because he ha he had that power mm. yeah it's a story within a story isn't it with yeah yep. it's it, yeah it, you think how do these guys get to the top you know top of a major movie uh, organization just yeah <clears throat> now i won't mention the word sociopath or anything like that you know but hey you, you know, won't mention that <laughs> 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 see that's see that's manipulation right there, Paul. Okay, I'm not going to mention sociopath, and I'm not going to. Okay, we're talking about your mother. I'm not going to talk. I don't want to mention people who are just loyal to their children because that wouldn't be fair. To them. <laughs> so, suddenly, there it is. It's out. It's out. It's <laughs> out. That's it. Yeah, de yeah I'm, I'm going to deny that. I'll de if, if you say I said it, I'll deny it. Uh, uh, yeah. And, and, and yeah. Look, looking, uh, thinking about the the whole staging of that because you know something I find fascinating as well is staging. I did the whole course with you and we analysed lots of different movie scenes, really amazing mm -hmm. movies. And you broke it all down. How the staging has massive influence on on the whole production and on, particularly on the actors to make them feel a certain way. And a lot of the time you're just making them feel really uncomfortable because or, or whatever feeling it is their character needs to feel. So that really right. helps the actor to to be in that character um and, and yeah thinking of the staging there was pretty amazing as well and one of the um the scenes that we looked at was from um yeah, game of thrones that scene where everyone comes and sits and there's all this power mm -hmm. play um yeah. it's sort of yeah it's not exactly like that but it's like he's like the king bear you know so you sort of mm -hmm. drag the chair because on that scene at the very end the um, forget the actor's name, but he's very short. Peter, yeah, Peter, the, Peter Dinklage. Yeah, Peter Dinklage. And so everyone sits down there and all these thinking they're in these powerful positions. There's no way for him to sit. And then he just drags the chair and everyone mm -hmm. has to take notice right to the other end of the table of the king. Like it was just really powerful staging. Yeah. And um, so I guess tell us a little bit more about how staging works as well. And then can that be applied also to pitching or startup 
Well, yeah, to go to your second question, yes, mm -hmm. um, the staging can be applied to the pitching. Not only in, like what I just did in telling this, my story, I mean, I mentioned the staging, what this, pretty much what the staging was in the scene that I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. It's another part of the staging in terms of pitching, which it's a little, it's trickier, is if you're pitching to somebody, where are they? Where are they standing? Where are you? Where are you moving? Are you moving? In other words, how you stage, you can be pitching a story, but also there's another story going on, which is the story of you pitching. Is, is this relationship between you and this other person? How do you want to place yourself in relationship to that person mm -hmm. to either take the power away from them or give them the power? My kneeling down is I gave him power. Mm -hmm. You know, because I could feel my standing. I'm not that tall, but he wasn't any, you know, his. I was higher than his eye line, mm -hmm. which can be a little intimidating, especially if I move close to him. And so I, I bring myself down, which probably made him, I'm guessing, made him feel, oh, that's good. Mm -hmm. Now, kneeling is a little extreme, but hey, why not? You're trying to, you're trying to get $9 million quickly. <laughs> um, you know, you might as well go for it. So those are the, two, in terms of pitching, there's two stagings that's going on. The way you describe the staging in the story you're doing and the way you are actually consciously or sometimes unconsciously staging the um the pitch itself mm -hmm. even to the point of something else i demonstrated a little bit a few moments ago i said i came around the corner i saw it and you'll, you'll never guess who i saw part of staging uh, um also has to do with delivery of lines and and how you're manipulating that because if i say i came around the corner you'll never guess who i saw and i keep i saw i mean there he was he was tall he was intimidating I, I can keep going on. Or I could say, I'm coming around the corner. You'll never guess who I saw. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, you'll never get. No, I'm pausing. I'm leaving it hanging there. That's mm -hmm. part of staging, too. In other words, I'm, that's manipulation. I'm yeah. dangling a carrot in front of him. I'm not going to give him any more information. How I am <clears throat> delivering the rhythm of the lines and taking pauses or even taking breaks. Or where, when do I reach for a couple, you know, a couple, you say you're at, um, you're pitching at a cafe table. Yeah. You know, when do you reach for your coffee and take a sip? That's a good reason to stop talking. But you've also broken the story intentionally. Yeah. And then like I said, you, you never guess who I saw. No, no, you'll yeah. never get now you could now this this is staging. Yeah. 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 No, yeah. you're not. No, no. Hold, hold on a minute. No, no, okay, hold on. <laughs> so it's all manip it's all I'm playing, I'm playing with. I'm not so much playing with his mind, although I am. What I'm really playing with, which is really wonderful, is his imagination. I'm stimulating his imagination. And that's what I need. Anytime you're pitching or telling a story, you want to activate the listener's imagination. You don't want them sitting back and just absorbing whatever you do, whatever you say. You want them to be a participant. And so you have to get them to participate in the story, even though they don't know where the story is going. And, and Mark, as you said before, you've done a lot of um, one-man shows, like for other people, yep. a lot. Um, and that's, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure, uh, I, from a few stories that you said, one was about a comedian and the other one was a story about this man's mother. And um, with the mother, you, I think they wanted to put an image of the mother. So in, the, in those shows, there's no images, there's no backdrop or anything. It's just all yeah. about the story and telling the story. And yeah, then, it, was his, it was his wife, not his mother. That's okay. Oh, sorry, his wife, his wife. Yep. So can you tell us about that and then why you advised him not to put his wife's picture up? Okay, this this is a one-man show about a wife, his wife who dies from cancer. Yeah. To make it, yeah. And basically it's him telling his story of everything he went through with her. And, and it's a very powerful story. And when we first were putting together, this is the first one person show I had done. And Paul, the performer, oh, he had all sorts of props and things he wanted to bring in mm -hmm. to help clarify what was going on. And slowly we got rid of a lot of them. But then there was a talk about having a picture of his wife, the, the woman he's talking about for the whole show, have a mm -hmm. picture of her there, either 
project it on a wall or have it someplace. And um, I kept thinking, no, no, because a couple, two reasons. One reason <clears throat> is I know how easy it is to you have one person on the set, one person or on the platform or in front of an audience, how easy it is to upstage them, take the power away from it. Do it like that. Mm-hmm. You can do it like that with a piece of music, with a, with a graphic, with anything that will pull the audience's attention away from what the person is talking about. Mm-hmm. Now, if what you put on the, on the screen is exactly what they're talking about, then it, it, you'll probably be okay. But if mm-hmm. you leave that picture there too long, they'll just keep looking at it. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's a, it's a, it's an aspect of working in, especially in theater. So I said, no, no, I kept saying, Paul, no, no. But I remember one time after a performance, it had been running for a while, we were in the lobby and Paul and I were talking to a lot of people who were there who didn't know Paul or his wife at all. And he showed them a picture of her. It's a beautiful picture. And there were two people in that group that went, no, no. And we went, oh, what do you, what do you mean? I thought at first that they knew her or something, that, that suddenly oh. realized that they knew her. No, no, no. That, that. Oh, I said, what do you mean? That's no, that, I'm sorry. That's not her. That's not the her I saw during the play. Yeah. That each person in that audience, say about 100 people there, have a different image of her based on what Paul is telling them, based on just the information and the storytelling. And that image they have of her is perfect for them. It may not be the image that anybody else in the audience has. So getting back to what you were talking about, there are two things in storytelling Mm -hmm. that are very important. Number one is your partner in storytelling. You have a partner. You don't think you do. You think you're all alone. Your partner is the other person's imagination. Okay. That's what you have to keep triggering. Have to have, have, even if you say, remember what it was like when you got caught in a snowstorm or a rainstorm and you, you weren't dressed warm enough. Now I'm just triggering their imagination. Either they'll have a memory, which would be great, or they'll create. Now I'm just triggering something yeah. in every single member of the audience to get them to hold on to something. And so they will participate in the storytelling in their imagination if i give them something to look at and say this is this is what the storm looked like and then, oh, so what <laughs> they, their imagination is so so powerful and you have to honor that imagination and don't distrust it then there are a lot of set designers say oh yeah but we have to build a set we have to make it look like this and we have to make it look like hollywood and i said no 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 we don't we don't have to so most of the shows that i've done seriously mm-hmm. One person shows, <clears throat> there are two things I start with, the performer and usually a stool or a chair, something to sit on. That's it. Uh-huh. That's it. And then we can do a whole show with, with just the, just that. And I've done entire yeah. shows with just a stool, you know, something. And the, the sitting just gives us a chance, my, myself a chance to do some staging or to give the place, this performer, a place to sit and relax for a moment or whatever. And that's it. But there's nothing behind them to distract them. Now, there may be colors on a psych or something like that, you know, to make a nice warm environment, but nothing, nothing distracting. Mm. It's similar to uh, comedians. They work like that as well. It's just mm-hmm. them and nothing on the background, usually a stool or something. Yep. And that, that leads me into a story, um, uh, one man's show about a comedian that uh, you told us in, in the course. And, um, and that goes back to, um, in your storytelling where you, you've already spoke about what you call the naive narrator, which is in the moment, telling the story. Right. Well, you just said that you can, you can pull them out and give some details, etc. cetera. Um, and then there's also speeding things up and slowing things down, which I, mm-hmm. I found fascinating. I actually wrote a blog post once using that, and people really liked it. But um, I, the one – you can you can tell the story about that um, – a comedian and mm-hmm. how to speed up the process and how you did that because I, I found that fascinating. Yeah, yeah, and it's what what it is. Those two, one is called com, uh, compression, the other one is called expansion. Yeah. They are 
uh, storytelling techniques or writing techniques, you can do them in just a, in a novel or whatever, where you can either compress time, take a big chunk of time and bring it down into a much smaller p actual time. You could take a year and put it into a minute or something like that. Or the expansion, um, which is if something traumatic, something startling happens to the storyteller, to the main character, that is so um, life altering or impactful emotionally, you can open up time and actually stop time. So, so you spend time in that reaction more than, I mean, it could be witnessing a car crash, let's say a car crash, and it, which will happen like that, and then it's over. But on, in the storytelling, you're going to expand it so you can actually take the audience deep into what you're seeing, what you're feeling, and all of that. The compression is the one you're talking about with the um, so with Dana Gould, the comedian, where we had to compress. There was about a year of his life that was really, really important that he went from being a, a successful stand-up comic traveling around to rising, 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 and getting more bookings and traveling more and more acclaim and more acclaim. But simultaneously, he was getting more and more frustrated. He was not getting the, his agent wasn't working well enough. He couldn't get on the Tonight Show. There are other things in his career that he were. So it was a combination of success, success, along with frustrating perception of things not working out to the point. Now, Dana and I know this is what we're going for, it's a key part of the story um, that he on stage performing on stage live on stage has a nervous breakdown on stage and keeps performing, keeps telling all his jokes. But the world around him changes and the world around him changes into monsters and things like that. And that's what he thought that happened. <laughs> now, I knew this. And so we're aiming for that moment of the breakdown. But we have to give the breakdown a reason. You can't just have a break there. The reason was building up the tension between success and failure to the point that it just it sort of burned him out from the inside. So we, we compressed that year into everything he was doing. He told me everything he was doing about this new girlfriend, about that, and how well that was going, about his traveling and telling a lot of jokes. And the key to it was as he got more successful, he got tired of telling jokes. Tired of the same jokes over again. They always work. They work well. They're great jokes, but it got tired of that. So the compression went something like this. Fly to New York, tell a joke, fly home. Fly to Atlanta, tell a joke, fly home. Fly to Chicago, tell a joke, fly home. Meet Anne, fall in love with Anne. And fly to San Diego, tell a joke. Why can't I get a new agent? Fly home. So it's all done in, in little pieces like that. Now, each one of those things that the flying goes all the way through all the whole thing. Fly here, fly there, fly there. Tell a joke. goes. Tell a joke is a mantra that gets repeated throughout the entire piece. And then woven into is like meet Anne. There's one moment, fly to Wisconsin. Meet a waitress. Don't tell Anne. Fly home. <laughs> and just that don't tell Anne tells you there's a whole story right in there. So it's all compressing every little moment into a, a phrase. And it ended with... This whole, and it lasted one minute, exactly one minute. Yeah. And the end, end of it was, um, fly to, he started to repeat, fly to New York, tell a joke, tell a joke, tell a joke. Fly to Atlanta, tell a joke, tell a joke, tell a joke. Fly home, tell a joke, tell, fly mm -hmm. home. Now, why can't I find it? Then it ended with tell a joke, 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 tell a joke. And you could just feel him right. shrinking. And then mm -hmm. we go into the emotional breakdown. Oh, really? So that's compressing, and it's compressing. Yeah. And now, getting back to what I was saying before, Paul, just think about it. I mean, just watching you and anybody who's listening or watching, you get it very quickly. Do you know why? Your imagination. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, all, I'm doing, all I'm doing is giving you triggers. I'm not explaining anything. Mm -hmm. I'm doing triggers, no explanations, no details, just hitting those. Now, it takes a long time to write something like that. Yeah. You know, to, to work it out. But that's compression. Obviously, in startups, um, 
there's there's a lot of risk. I mean, the whole thing about doing startups, you, you've got to be a bit of a risk taker. Mm -hmm. uh, just to a lot of you know, people may leave their job or they may put a lot of their own money or others, um, you know, into this thing that they really believe in. They have this future project and something that's going to to work and to to help people. Um, so there's a lot of risk taking in that, and and I'm guessing really there's a lot of risk taking in the movie industry as well. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so even just making a movie, there, there'd be lots of risk taking, and um, so I guess as a director, when you're directing the movie, um, and, and you you went through that earlier experience, um, but now I know you work with a lot of really quite famous directors as well. Mm -hmm. and, um, this whole thing coming back to intuition as well. Um, I spoke with quite a few of my guests and we talk about intuition. A lot of them, like me, think that that first thought you get, intuition or instinct, is mm -hmm. usually going to be the right one. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've heard you talk like when, when you're on a set, you need to make decisions. You need to be the person that makes a decision. And, you know, it may end up being wrong, but you need to make that decision. But at the same time, I know that you have a huge respect for everybody, crew, actors, everybody, and you'll take ideas from everybody as well. So it's, I think it's very similar in the startup space. Like as a founder, you're the one that has that vision, mm -hmm. but you've got this whole team with you as well. And like in my case and my co-founder, we you know, have a lot of respect and we treated everybody really well. And I know you do the same. Uh, and, and anyone with ideas will take that on. But in the end of the day, you're the one who has to make that decision. Mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts around that? <laughs> yeah. Well, um, not having started a business like you talked, except for my own, this business, yeah. which we talked about that I do now, um, which has its own risk. But the, yeah, the risks in filmmaking are huge. Because a lot of times, in order just in order to get the money, to in order to get, well, you're asking a lot of people to put up money for something that doesn't exist. Well, it's the same as, as a startup. It, yeah, yeah, yeah it, do, it doesn't exist. So we're doing a lot of comparisons. Like it's going to be a little bit like this story. It's going to be more like this story or this or this film. Look how much money it made. And you're doing a lot of comparisons to try to support your vision, although you have no guarantee that it's going to be as good as that other film. You have no. It, you can't guarantee anything. So yeah. it, it, it is really high risk. And the some of the riskiest ones are actually independent ones where the people who have, are investing it are investing it to make money. Mm. Now, the studios are doing that too, but the studios have so many movies that they're making that one film that doesn't do well, they can absorb that and they can move on. They'll be fine. Yeah. But when you're dealing with a group of dentists who have put all their money together to invest it in something and then, and then some kind of venture of a film, boy, and they become personal friends, boy, it, it really, it really gets, it gets tough. It gets tough. Yeah. But getting back to instinct and tuition, basically, that's all you've got. The base and the main thing is just to make sure do not abandon your vision or your instincts. Even if your instincts are saying go a slightly different way in the middle of creating the project, listen to them. Listen to them. I mean that that's they're hiring you because of your skills. That's what they're hiring you for. So you got you got to follow those and literally do the best you can. And then there's all the other thing, which is people's personal agendas and studio politics and distributor politics and um, I have one film I worked on. Uh, it was an <clears throat> independent film, and it wasn't that expensive. It was like twenty-five million, something like that. And they had a good distributor attached. The distributor in the middle of post-production, distribution company had a major turnover in their clientele. So mm -hmm. all the people at the top seat went. A lot of new people into the top, and this is another dynamic that can destroy you. And lots of times, those people who take over projects at the other the other executives were doing yeah. would rather see those projects die than succeed. Wow. It's, it's an ego thing. And so they put their energy that No, no, we'll take care of you. Don't worry about that. But the, it's not the passion that they, that, that was there originally. They don't know it that well. They don't care about it that much. 
And sometimes this has been, you know, when there's been a bit of a takeover within a company and you're sitting there with your film and you're almost done. You're going, oh, what's going to happen to my film? Well, it may, it still got distributed, everything. Everything was done, but not with the passion and the enthusiasm that you had hoped for. It's a pretty brutal industry, isn't it? Yeah. It's very, it's very brutal. Mm. It's interesting. I mean, I won't go into this, but I wrote and made a short film called The Baritones, which is based on The Sopranos. But The Baritones is about <clears throat> the film, bi film business and how it's no different than the mafia. And uh -huh. we, 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 we even use the same terms, you know, uh -huh. kill that project. You know, you know, I mean, a lot, a lot of, a lot of the terms are the same. Like, okay, and and that the business is it is brutal. It is really, really brutal. Yeah. And, and look, even the startup industry is pretty brutal as well. Is it? I think yeah. it's around one out of twenty actually succeed, and mm -hmm. a lot of the um, the. Um, People are looking, uh, like investors now, they're looking for the unicorns, you know, they're like over a yep. million dollars. And, and then, you know, a lot of, they're not so much interested in, in others that, you know, between that, you know, mums and dads sort of business and unicorn, there's so many more that could have a sustainable business as well, but yeah, yeah. it's really hard to get funding. And um, also going back to that point about changing executives and that sort of thing, um, if you start getting clients, say, with uh, a big company or... You know, or you know, small company, whatever it might be, um, then uh, the people that you, where your contacts change as well, you can lose that as mm -hmm. well. That's mm -hmm. why it's to like in the industry to get as many clients as you can, so you're not just depending on one big client. Because if right. Happens, they leave you. You may you know completely yeah lose well, like, all the And along those lines, Paul, like in my business, I mean, I have a lot of clients. And I have some clients that have been clients for like 20 years. And one client I've worked with him on five or six different films. But I am at the mercy of the industry because if something affects where he's trying to set up a film, suddenly I don't have work. And, and that film gets stalled or something. You know, in other words, each individual client, I'm, I'm at the tail end of, of a whole system. Mm -hmm. But that means I'm the first thing that can be dropped, you know, like, sorry, Mark, we don't have any more money. We're going to have to stop doing the work, you know, wow. because we lost We One investor dropped out or mm -hmm. the investor's mm -hmm. wife didn't like the script. So he's gone. And, you, go, you know, so sometimes little whims like that it can, can affect. So having multiple clients like I do is important. And they sort of rise and fall like, you know, some of them come up yeah, and the others go down and projects come and go. Yeah. Financing comes and goes. It's very tricky. What would be a, a project that you've worked on that would hold like a special emotional significance for you? Well, a, a Bronx Tale, which I mentioned, mm -hmm. um, because that was like years of work, um, okay. and I'm very, I'm very proud. I'm not, I'm not. I'll tell you a story about that. Too. I'm not proud of internally. How it ended up internally, I mean, between myself and the and and Chaz and all the things. But as a product, I'm very proud, of, very very proud of it. So I hold that in, in great pride. Um, there's there's others like with George Tillman. I did one. It's called Men of Honor. That was a Robert De Niro, Cuba Gooding Jr. film. I think it's a it's a great film. And George was a had only done a couple of films prior to that. He did a great job. Now he's directing a lot which is good. Mm -hmm. So a lot of my pride is in individual directors who keep going. Another one is a young Messiah, which I worked on for like mm, three, about three years, I think of work. Mm -hmm. Now, when I say three years of work, it's off and on and off and on because we're different. That's from the script yeah. all the way up through production. And that one I was in, I was there during production uh, mm -hmm. in Europe and Italy where we were shooting it. And so I was very closely connected with that. And I was brought in to actually turn a nine-year-old boy actor who was the lead actor in this movie yeah. it, to play seven-year-old Jesus. I had to turn this little boy into Jesus every day. And mm -hmm. that was my job. And so I'm very proud of what we achieved there. So lots of times my pride is not so much in the um, success of a film because I know how... Yeah. how amorphous that is and how um, 
it can just change. But in the quality of the film and the quality of the work that we did and the depth of the work that we did on that film, I have another film now that's in um, post-production in New Zealand called Pike, P-I-K-E. Do you know about the Pike mining disaster? Uh, I think I've... It's in something. New Zealand. Anyway, it's the whole story about that mining disaster. And I have not seen any of it, but I've worked with Rob Sarkis, who's writer, director on it. And so yeah. that's the one that's going on now. I'm just very excited to whenever yeah. I hear from him, he says, okay, I have something to show you. It'll be anyway, they're, they're, I get a, very excited because of the nature of the stories we work on. And when I don't do, you know, those big mega super powerful, you know, Superman, Iron Man things. But anyway, some of the, some of the films are, very, 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 very proud of yeah. of those, yeah. Well, going back to storytelling, I mean, the Superman, Iron Man type of things, um, you know, superheroes. So I, I, you know, I, I really think Americans have an obsession with superheroes. Everyone's got to have some sort of, I'm just like, oh, yeah. superhero, no, I don't want to see it. Um, yeah. Too much action, don't want to see it. Just it's back to stories again. I mean, you can have a lot of action and a really great story. But it's it's the stories as well. I find those movies really boring. I think Hollywood's gone off the tilt a bit in yep. that area. It's the, the biggest productions, the biggest explosions, the biggest car chase. If there's no story, it's like uh, you just you know, it's just boring to be honest. Yep. No comment there, Mark. <laughs> no, well, you know, well, the comment is if you, if you look at any big studio that's doing that, and most of them are. I mean, the every every whether it's Disney or Warner's or Universal, every studio has its franchise that it's working on. I mean, the yeah. Impossible Mission Impossible series—that's a franchise. They all these and these are <clears throat> because they make a lot of money. Mm. They cost a lot of money. They make a lot of money, and that's what keeps the studios going. Right. So it keep, keeps them going. But then you have another. Um, reality to deal with besides all those big superhero movies is um streaming netflix hulu mm -hmm. there was one film that i worked on for a short time not a good film not a good script and it turned out to be a mediocre film and netflix paid 50 million dollars to make this stupid mm -hmm. little movie and i go 50 million dollars i mean i've got clients who you know i got if I split that between three of my clients, they could each make the movie that just, you know, but that that has tipped the scale a lot where of uh, flowers of the, I'm sorry, Killers of the Flower Moon, Martin Scorsese, over $300 million to make, well, a three and a half hour movie, which doesn't need to be three and a half hours, but that's okay. But that was Netflix, Netflix and Apple, whoever, who throw the money at him. And so there's that reality of where the money is going, you know, and how can, how do you get that money? And I have a, I have a, actually, I have a director I'm working with, I've worked with a long time, who has this, a story that takes place at the same time as Killers of the Flower Moon, but it's all told from the Indian's point of view. It's a small movie and only needs about $30 million to make it. Mm -hmm. And he looks at $300 million for, for that, all I need is 30. And his is a much more heartfelt, passionate, and it's, and it's also a true story. He'll get it made eventually. But, you know, so I watch all of that happen. And the money, it's, it's all about money. So if those big, <clears throat> those big superhero movies, if they don't make money, they'll shut it, they'll shut it down. In fact, there was one film recently that they thought wouldn't make money, so they didn't even release it. They didn't put the money behind it to release it. Really? So they made it, and yeah, well, yeah, it's not good enough. Don't release it. Jeez, it's yeah, it is a brutal industry. It's, it's brutal. Yep. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, um, what about? Um, I mean, you've obviously worked with. You mentioned before Robert De Niro and actors like that. What, what are some of your um, favorites or stories that you have with some actors? I know you worked with Michael J. Fox as well in the early days mm -hmm. of this year. Any, any stories um, around working with actors that you can tell us about? Well, yeah, one thing, because you mentioned, which is an obvious thing to do, people of name, like Michael 
Michael J. Fox or Robert De Niro or people like that mentioned, people like that, Bill Pullman, some of these people I've worked with, Ned Beatty, Roddy McDowell and all that. One thing is you got to realize that someone who has, quote, a name, mm -hmm. um, just having that name, being recognized on the street, being recognized in a positive way, um, yeah. but being seen by the world because of what you have done, suddenly that has an enormous effect on your thinking and on on how you perceive yourself and <clears throat> one thing that i've run into with several of these people is um their fear of doing something doing a film or something that's going to hurt that image mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. even though oh this is a great part oh i'd love to play this part Ah, it's too dangerous. Can't do it. It's gonna. It's going to hurt my image. So there, there's that. There's also the ego part of them, depending on the actor. You know that they do know what they're doing, mm -hmm. to the point that they won't listen to you because they don't want to go outside that comfort zone of believing that they. Not. So it's a whole different kind of personality. Each one is very different. They're not the same. Yeah. Each one is very, very different. And so you have to approach them and in a very different way and the best way to approach them as no differently than you would approach any other actor humbly mm -hmm. and gratefully and, gr and grateful that they are doing your project that they're in your pro thank you and mm -hmm. allowing them the space to be as creative and as collaborative as possible as they want to be and some mm -hmm. some people some um actors i've worked with i've had a couple tell me just to, you know, no, we're not going to discuss this. Just tell me what you want. T tell me what you're looking for. Right. No discussion. Let's not let's not debate it. Let's not explore it. Just tell me what you want. Really, and I sometimes I tell them what they want, and but they'll deliver it. I go, well, that's okay. So that's the way that person works now. So <laughs> you you have to adjust yourself to the way they're working. No different than they're adjusting themselves to the way you're working. It has nothing to do with them being stars. It has to do with them being experienced actors. Mm. In fact, Donald Sutherland once said this. I did not meet him, but this was in an interview. He said he stopped going to see <clears throat> the films he made. He said, wasn't, he says, I can't take it. I can't take it. He says, I have the memory of making that film. I have the memory of building that character. I have the memory of all of that. And it's rich. Now I go see the film. It's going to get diminished. I'm going to go, that's what they did with it. That's all that's left. He says, so I don't go. He says, but when I'm working, it's very simple. It's very simple. I just tell, say to the director, tell me what you want. I'll give it to you. Just tell me what you want. And he can. Mm, so, so, the, you know, so each, each one is a, a different person. Others need a lot of rehearsal. Some of them are not good until like eight, take eight or seven or eight because they need to rehearse with the camera rolling or something. So it's just learning that each one is a different personality. Mm. It's interesting um, about Don Sutherland as well, because my daughter was going to a Steiner school and they're like a very creative sort of school. And whenever they have their school plays or anything that happens, no one's allowed to film anything because they want them, because they take that experience, they'll remember that experience. And then if you play it back, it's, not, it's the same thing. It's not what they remember. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so I, I sort of get that, you know. I mean, obviously the parents all want to have those memories, but if yep. the child also had memory themselves. And, yep. and in that school as well, they, they do the whole production. They write the scripts. They fill the sets. They do everything. So it's, it's a really nice. Fun. Very nice. Yeah. All right, Mark. Well, um, look, last question that I, I always ask people um, is if there's a question, uh, is there a question that no one has ever asked you that you, <laughs> that you wish they would have asked you or maybe something about yourself that no one knows and you'd like them to know? Yeah, I've, 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 I have mm -hmm. a question that sometimes I answer without it being asked. Um, yeah. Um, but I'll tell you what it is. And then after that, I do want to talk to your listeners or viewers. Is this, is this shown both visually and audio? Is yeah. It, yeah. Some people only use audio. Um, yeah. Okay. But, 
Yeah, but I, I want to I, I want to offer them a gift um, or a way they can get in touch with me, which is a gift. I, I want to do that. But the question. It's two words. What's next? <laughs> OK, Mark, you've done all of this. You've worked with all these people. You've been doing this work. I'm, I'm stating it the, sort of the obvious. You've been doing this work for what? 40 or 50 years, you've been working with all these people all around the world um, and training and teaching and blah, 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 and writing about it and recording videos. What's next or what haven't you done yet that you want to do? Yeah, great question. <laughs> you like that one? I love it. I love it. Yeah. I'll, I'll yeah. use that in the future as well. You can, yeah, you can use that. Use that before you ask whatever. Then, then you yeah. can say what other. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so I, I will tell you what, what I'm doing now. I'll tell you and your viewers what I'm doing. Uh, because of all the, a lot of this has to do with COVID. I'm going to go back to the beginning of COVID. Uh, when Elsha, my wife, and I were living in, the, in Los Angeles. And we had spent the past few years doing what I do, which is traveling around the world, um, teaching and lecturing and coaching and doing all that. And we were planning for the beginning of 2020. Well, we, we knew what we were going to do in 2020, somewhat. We had four trips planned. One was to New Zealand, one was to Australia, one was to wow. Cyprus, and the other one was to Sweden. And the actual dates hadn't been set yet, but the, otherwise there were commitments. And then COVID went whack. And all yeah. of those things went whack like that. Exactly. And as I'm sure you experienced and everybody else did, suddenly it's like, oh, the whole world's changing. What do I do? And our world changed a lot because, first of all, there's no traveling. Uh, there's no nothing. I mean, we had basic, and then we were living in LA and we had to stay sequestered in our homes. There was all that. So, what do we do? And so, during that, the following months, or what happened was the, uh, the school in Sweden, I'm still in touch with them. And they said, could you do something online? Like, like what you and I are doing now, could you do it? And I hadn't been doing anything like that at all. But of course I said, yes, I said, because at least it was something. And it's a long story, all the preparation I did for that and how I changed everything I was doing in the last two days before I did it. And then I improvised myself. And anyway, it went well, but it was a big learning curve for me. So since that time I've, learned that I consciously said, I have to change my business. Now, this gets back to even the on, entrepreneurship and all that. I have to read, change my business the way I deliver it, because I'm not allowed to do what I usually do. And I have to do something else. So that's when I went into learning about working online and Zoom and cameras and all that and webinars. And now, and since then, I've done a lot of webinars. I've done a lot of interviews, a lot of podcasts. So a lot of my work now is online like this. And a few years ago, we moved. We're now in Hawaii. Uh, we decided to leave L.A. One reason uh, we left L.A. is because I've always wanted to live in Hawaii, but never felt that I could because I couldn't figure out how to do my work there. Mm -hmm. How do I do my work? I mean, I'm in this little island and, I'm in, and there aren't that many people. <laughs> it's isolated. But because of the Zoom and because of the Internet, I can. So I'm here still doing that work. So the what's next? The what's next is I remember announcing to Elsha, I think it was just before we moved. I said, OK, the next big project is what I call my legacy project. Now, this is a very conscious project. I am and I'm still working on it, it's going well, I'm going to make sure everything I know, everything I teach, everything I've created, uh, everything I want to share with the world is has been recorded someplace, is available someplace. There's a lot of stuff now on YouTube. There's a lot of stuff on, we have we have an online teaching school where you can, where you can go and take classes, a lot of the, Every every course I did, like you mentioned, a lot of those courses, all of those courses were recorded and then they're re-edited and repurposed and put online so people long after I'm gone can still get. So that's the legacy project. That's what's yeah. next. Making sure that everything um, is recorded. Yeah. Yeah. And made available like this recording. That's, this is part of it. You're yeah. part of it. 
Thank you. <laughs> so that's that's what's yeah. next. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's um, it's really important to 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 do that because I, I find your teachings um, are really different to to others in the industry. And for me, just as soon as I started hearing you on some other uh, interviews, I thought oh, that makes total. It's just really just made total sense, and I've just been really into your stuff ever since. I, I found it really helpful. Not just because I haven't done a lot of directing, but um, just in, in life in general and story, mm -hmm. yeah, the whole, it, it, it's really fascinating um, area for me. So I'm really um, very grateful that you've come on as well um, to the show. And um, I hope this can be, well, and I'm sure it'll be helpful to others as well. Um, obviously, the audience is um, startup founders and there's, there's lots of words, pieces of wisdom in here that it's going to help them. And mm -hmm. it's a really interesting story as well. So, so Mark, you said you have a, a gift for us? Well, it's ideas, well, sort of invitations, I guess. First of all, um, and if do you, do you put up graphics at the end of your things? Yeah, yeah I can do yeah. Yeah. In other words, some, some of what I'm going to say you could put up so they can see it. If, if people want to get in touch with me, it's really easy. It's just Mark W. Travis. There's a W in there. Mark W. Travis at gmail.com. Mm -hmm. The website, my company is called Travis International Film Institute. T-I-F-I. -I. So it's T-I-F-I -I dot U-S. You can go to the website and you can see all sorts of things in there. You can sign up for newsletters and all of that stuff. Get on, get on our mailing list and all of that. For those who are listening to this or watching it and want to get in touch with me or are interested in any of the services that I offer, the consulting services, coaching services, training, anything like that, yeah. I have an offer for you, but you have to uh, mention this podcast. Otherwise, you don't get it. <laughs> the podcast. The offer is, and you just write to me at my email address, markwtravis.com, markwtravis at gmail.com, I'm sorry. and. Uh, you get one half hour free consultation. Wow. Now, the free consultation means, yeah, I can, I'll tell you about all the things I can offer, or you may have a question. You may have say, say you, you, know, you were talking about the pitching. Could you explain something? This, I, it's your time. It's your free half hour to use mm -hmm. however you want. I w or if it's just say, or if you want to just say, here's a project I'm working on. How could you help? Here's what I want to, here's the pr pursuit I'm going. I want to be a director. I want to be a writer. I want to be an actor. Whatever it is, you get a free half hour with me and we'll discuss. I'll do the best to help you in any way I can for that half hour. That's it. Now, that will be really valuable. And I, I've done those um, one on ones before and I found it really valuable as well. So, yeah, I highly uh, recommend. Um, any of the audience to to take advantage on that. Mm -hmm. get huge from that. Really appreciate that, Mark. Okay, you are very very welcome. I look forward to hearing from any of you out there that uh, want to be in touch. Yeah, I'm I'm sure there'll be uh, a lot of interest. Uh, awesome. Well, thank you so much, okay. Mark, for your time and uh, your many many words of wisdom and. Um, I'm, as I said before, I'm sure this will be very valuable to many people in the startup industry. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, um, thank you so much. You're very, very welcome. I, appre I appreciate the, the time and effort and energy you put into what you do, Paul. So it's very important. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you.